the rediscovery of trauma lessons from vietnam veterans i became what i am today at the age of 12 on a frigid overcast day in the winter of 1975 that was a long time ago but it's wrong what they say about the past looking back now i realize i have been peeking into that deserted alley for the last 26 years khaled hosseini the kite runner some people's lives seem to flow in a narrative mine had many stops and starts that's what trauma does it interrupts the plot it just happens and then life goes on no one prepares you for it jessica stern denial a memoir of terror the tuesday after the 4th of july weekend 1978 was my first day as a staff psychiatrist at the boston veterans administration's clinic as i was hanging a reproduction of my favorite bruegel painting the blind leading the blind on the wall of my new office i heard a commotion in the reception area down the hall a moment later a large disheveled man in a stained three piece suit carrying a copy of soldier of fortune magazine under his arm burst through my door he was so agitated and so clearly hung over that i wondered how i could possibly help this hulking man i asked him to take a seat and tell me what i could do for him his name was tom 10 years earlier he had been in the marines doing his service in vietnam He had spent the holiday weekend holed up in this downtown Boston law office, drinking and looking at old photographs, rather than with his family. He knew from previous years' experience that the noise, the fireworks, the heat, and the picnic in his sister's backyard against the backdrop of dense early summer foliage, all of which reminded him of Vietnam, would drive him crazy. When he got upset, he was afraid to be around his family because he behaved like a monster with his wife and two young boys. The noise of his kids made him so agitated that he would storm out of the house to keep himself from hurting them, only drinking himself into oblivion or riding his Harley Davidson at dangerously high speeds helped him to calm down. Nighttime offered no relief. His sleep was constantly interrupted by nightmares about an ambush in the rice paddy back in Nam, in which all the members of his platoon were killed or wounded. He also had terrifying flashbacks in which he saw dead Vietnamese children. The nightmares were so horrible that he dreaded falling asleep and he often stayed up for most of the night drinking. In the morning his wife would find him passed out on the living room couch and she and the boys had to tiptoe around him while she made them breakfast before taking them to school. Filling me on his background, Tom said that he had graduated from high school in 1965, the valedictorian of his class. In line with his family tradition of military service, He enlisted in the Marine Corps immediately after graduation. His father had served in World War II in General Patton's army, and Tom never questioned his father's expectations. Athletic, athletic, intelligent, and an obvious leader, Tom felt powerful and effective after finishing basic training, a member of a team that was prepared for just about anything. In Vietnam, he quickly became a platoon leader in charge of eight other Marines. Surviving slogging through the mud while being strafed by machine gun fire can leave people feeling pretty good about themselves and their comrades. At the end of his tour of duty, Tom was honorably discharged, and all he wanted was to put Vietnam behind him. Outwardly, that's exactly what he did. He attended college on the GI Bill, graduated from law school, and married his high school sweetheart, and had two sons. Tom was upset by how difficult it was to feel any real affection for his wife, even though her letters had kept him alive in the madness of the jungle. Tom went through the motions of living a normal life, hoping that by faking it, he would learn to become his old self again. He now had a thriving law practice and a picture-perfect family, but he sensed he wasn't normal. He felt dead inside. Although Tom was the first veteran I'd ever encountered on the professional basis, Many aspects of his story were familiar to me. I grew up in post-war Holland, playing in bombed-out buildings, and son of a man who had been such an outspoken opponent of the Nazis that he had been sent to an internment camp. My father never talked about his war experiences, but he was given to outbursts of explosive rage that stunned me as a little boy. How could the man I heard quietly going down the stairs every morning to pray and read the Bible while the rest of the family slept have such a terrifying temper? How could someone whose life was devoted to the pursuit of social justice be so filled with anger? I witnessed the same puzzling behavior in my uncle, who had been captured by the Japanese in the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia, and sent as a slave laborer to Burma. 
where he walked in the famous bridge over the river Kwai. He also rarely mentioned the war, and he, too, often erupted into uncontrollable rages. As I listened to them, I wondered if my uncle and my father had had nightmares and flashbacks, if they, too, had felt disconnected from their loved ones and unable to find any real pleasure in their lives. Somewhere in the back of my mind, there must have been my memories of my frightened and often frightening mother, whose own childhood trauma was sometimes alluded to and, I now believe, was frequently reenacted. She had the unnerving habit of fainting when I asked her what her life was like as a little girl and then blaming me for making her so upset. Reassured by my obvious interest, Tom settled down to tell me just how scared and confused he was. He was afraid that he was becoming just like his father, who was always angry and rarely talked with his children, except to compare them unfavorably with his comrades who had lost their lives around Christmas 1944 during the Battle of the Bulge. As the session was drawing to a close, I did what doctors typically do. I focused on the one part of Tom's story that I thought I understood, his nightmares. As a medical student, I had worked in a sleep laboratory observing people's sleep dream cycles and had assisted in writing some articles about nightmares. I had also participated in some early research on the beneficial effects of psychoactive drugs that were just coming into the use in the 1970s. So while I lacked a true grasp of the scope of Tom's problems, the nightmares were something I could relate to, and as an enthusiastic believer in better living through chemistry, I prescribed a drug that we had found to be effective in reducing the incidence and the severity of the nightmares. I scheduled Tom for a follow-up visit two weeks later. When he returned for his appointment, I eagerly asked Tom how the medicines had worked. He told me he hadn't taken any of the pills. Trying to conceal my irritation, I asked him why. I realized that if I take the pills and the nightmares go away, he replied, I will have abandoned my friends and their deaths will have been in vain. I need to be a living memorial to my friends who died in Vietnam. I was stunned. Tom's loyalty to the dead was keeping him from living his own life, just as his father's devotion to his friends had kept him from living. Both fathers and sons' experiences on the battlefield had rendered the rest of their lives irrelevant. How had that happened and what could we do about it? That morning, I realized I would probably spend the rest of my professional life trying to unravel the mysteries of trauma. How do horrific experiences cause people to become hopelessly stuck in the past? What happens in people's minds and brains that keeps them frozen, trapped in a place they desperately wish to escape? Why did this man's war not come to an end in February of 1969, when his parents embraced him at Boston's Logan International Airport after his long flight back from Da Nang? Tom's need to live out his life as a memorial to his comrades taught me that he was suffering from a condition much more complex than simply having bad memories or damaged brain chemistry or altered fear circuits in the brain. Before the ambush in the rice paddy, Tom had been a devoted and loyal friend, someone who enjoyed life with many interests and pleasures. In one terrifying moment, trauma had transformed everything. During my time at the VA, I got to know many men who responded similarly. Faced with even minor frustrations, our veterans often flew instantly into extreme rages. The public areas of the clinic were pockmarked with the impacts of their fists on the dry walls, and the security was kept constantly busy protecting claims agents and receptionists from enraged veterans. Of course, their behavior scared us, but I also was intrigued. At home, my wife and I were coping with similar problems in our toddlers, who regularly threw temper tantrums when told to eat their spinach or to put on warm socks. Why was it, then, that I was utterly unconcerned about my kids' immature behavior but deeply worried about what was going on with the vets, aside from their size, of course, which gave them the potential to inflict much more harm than my two-footers at home? The reason was that I felt perfectly confident that, with proper care, my kids would gradually learn to deal with frustrations and disappointments. But I was skeptical that I would be able to help my veterans reacquire the skills of self-control and self-regulation that they had lost in war. Unfortunately, nothing in my psychiatric training had prepared me to deal with any of the challenges that Tom and his fellow veterans presented. I went down to the medical library to look for books on war neurosis, shell shock, battle fatigue, or any other term or diagnosis I could think of that might shed light on my patients. To my surprise, the library at the VA didn't have a single book about any of these conditions. Five years after the last American soldier left Vietnam, the issue of wartime trauma was still not on anybody's agenda. 
Finally, in the Count Way library at Harvard Medical School, I discovered the traumatic neurosis of war, which had been published in 1941 by a psychiatrist named Abraham Cardiner. It described Cardiner's observations of World War I veterans and had been released in anticipation of the flood of shell-shocked soldiers expected to be casualties of World War II. Cardiner reported the same phenomena I was seeing. After the war, his patients were overtaken by a sense of utility. They became withdrawn and detached, even if they had functioned well before. What Cardiner called traumatic neurosis, on the course, today we call post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Cardiner noted that sufferers from traumatic neurosis develop a chronic vigilance for and sensitivity to threat. His summation especially caught my eye. The nucleus of the neurosis is a physioneurosis. In other words, post-traumatic stress isn't all in one's head, undergoes, as some people supposed, but has a physiological basis. Cardiner understood even then that the symptoms have their origin in the entire body's response to the original trauma. Cardiner's description corroborated my own observations, which was reassuring, but it provided me with little guidance on how to help the veterans. The lack of literature on the topic was a handicap, but my great teacher, Elvin Semrath, had taught us to be skeptical about textbooks. We had only one real textbook, he said, our patients. We should trust only what we could learn from them and from our own experience. This sounds so simple, but even as Semrat pushed us to rely upon self-knowledge, he also warned us how difficult that process really is. Since human beings are experts in wishful thinking and obscuring the truth, I remember him saying, The greatest sources of our suffering are the lies we tell ourselves. Working at the VA, I soon discovered how excruciating it can be to face reality. This was true both for my patients and for myself. We don't really want to know what soldiers go through in combat. We do not really want to know how many children are being molested and abused in our own society or how many couples, almost a third as it turns out, engage in violence at some point during their relationship. We want to think of families as safe havens in a heartless world and of our own country as populated by enlightened civilized people. We prefer to believe that cruelty occurs only in faraway places like Darfur or the Congo. It is hard enough for observers to bear witness to pain. Is it any wonder, then, that the traumatized individuals themselves cannot tolerate remembering it, and that they often resort to using drugs, alcohol, or self-mutilation to block out their unbearable knowledge? Tom and fellow veterans became my first teachers in my quest to understand how lives are shattered by overwhelming experiences, and in figuring out how to enable them to feel fully alive again. Trauma and the Loss of Self the first study I did at the VA started with the systematically asking veterans what had happened to them in Vietnam. I wanted to know what had pushed them over the brink and why some had broken down as a result of that experience while others had been able to go on with their lives. Most of the men I interviewed had gone to war feeling prepared, drawn close by the rigors of basic training and the shared danger. They exchanged pictures of their families and girlfriends, they put up with one another's flaws, and they were prepared to risk their lives for their friends. Most of them confided their dark secrets to a buddy and some went so far as to share each other's shirts and socks. Many of the men had friendships similar to Tom's with Alex. Tom met Alex, an Italian guy from Malden, Massachusetts, on his first day in the country and they instantly became close friends. They drove their jeep together, listened to the same music and read each other's letters from home. They got drunk together and chased the same Vietnamese bar girls. After about three months in the country, Tom laid his square on a foot patrol through a rice paddy just before sunset. Suddenly a hail of gunfire spurted from the green wall of the surrounding jungle, hitting the men around him one by one. Tom told me how he had looked on in helpless horror as all the members of his platoon were killed or wounded in a matter of seconds. He would never get one image out of his mind. The back of Alex's head as he lay face down on the rice paddy, his feet in the air. Tom wept as he recalled, He was the only real friend I ever had. Afterward, at night, Tom continued to hear the screams of his men and to see their bodies falling into water. Any sounds, smells and images that reminded him of the ambush, like the popping of firecrackers on the 4th of July, made him feel just as paralyzed, terrified and enraged as he had the day the helicopter evacuated him from the rice paddy. Maybe even worse for Tom than the recurrent flashbacks of the ambush, was the memory of what happened afterward. I could easily imagine how Tom's rage about his friend's death had led to the calamity that followed. 
It took him months of dealing with his paralyzing shame before he could tell me about it. Since time immemorial, veterans like Achilles in Homer's Iliad have responded to the death of their comrades with unspeakable acts of revenge. The day after the ambush, Tom went into a frenzy to a neighboring village, killing children, shooting an innocent farmer, and raping a Vietnamese woman. After that, it became truly impossible for him to go home again in a meaningful way. How can you face your sweetheart and tell her that you brutally raped a woman just like her, or watch your son take his first step when you are reminded of the child you murdered? Tom experienced the death of Alex as if part of himself had been forever destroyed, the part that was good and honorable and trustworthy. Trauma, whether it is the result of something done to you or something you yourself have done, almost always makes it difficult to engage in intimate relationships. After you have experienced something so unspeakable, how do you learn to trust yourself or anyone else again? Or conversely, how can you surrender to an intimate relationship after you have been brutally violated? Tom kept showing up faithfully for his appointments, as I had become for him a lifeline, the father he'd never had, and Alex who had survived the ambush. It takes enormous trust and courage to allow yourself to remember. One of the hardest things for traumatized people is to confront the shame about the way they behaved during the traumatic episode, whether it is objectively warranted, as in the commission of atrocities, or not, as in the case of a child who tries to placate her abuser. One of the first people to write about the phenomenon was Sarah Halley, who occupied an office next to mine at the VA clinic. In an article entitled, When the Patient Reports Atrocities, which became a major impetus for the ultimate creation of the PTSD diagnosis, she discussed the well-nigh intolerable difficulty of talking about and listening to the horrendous acts that are often committed by soldiers in the course of their war experiences. It's hard enough to face the suffering that has been inflicted by others, but deep down many traumatized people are even more haunted by the shame they feel about what they themselves did or did not do under the circumstances. They despise themselves for how terrified, dependent, and excited or enraged they felt. In later years, I encountered similar phenomena in victims of child abuse. Most of them suffer from agonizing shame about the actions they took to survive and maintain a connection with the person who abused them. This was particularly true if the abuser was someone close to the child, someone the child depended on, as is so often the case. The result can be confusing about whether one was a victim or a willing participant, which in turn leads to bewilderment about the difference between love and terror, pain and pleasure. We will return to this dilemma throughout this book. Numbing Maybe the worst of Tom's symptoms was that he felt emotionally numb. He desperately wanted to love his family, but he just couldn't evoke any deep feelings for them. He felt emotionally distant from everybody, as though his heart were frozen and he were living behind a glass wall. The numbness extended to himself as well. He could not really feel anything except for his momentary rages and his shame. He described how he hardly recognized himself when he looked in the mirror to shave. When he heard himself arguing a case in court, he would observe himself from a distance and wonder how this guy, who happened to look and talk like him, to able to make such cogent arguments. When he won a case, he pretended to be gratified, and when he lost, it was as though he had seen it coming and was resigned to the defeat even before it happened. Despite the fact that he was a very effective lawyer, he always felt as though he were floating in space, lacking any sense of purpose or direction. The only thing that occasionally relieved his feeling of aimlessness was intense involvement in a particular case. During the course of her treatment, Tom had to defend a mobster on a murder charge. For the duration of the trial, he was totally absorbed in devising a strategy for winning the case, and there were many occasions on which he stayed up all night to immerse himself in something that actually excited him. It was like being in combat, he said. He felt truly alive, and nothing else mattered. The moment Tom won that case, however, he lost his energy and sense of purpose. The nightmares returned, as did his rage attacks, so intensely that he had to move into a motel to ensure that he would not harm his wife or children. But being alone too was terrifying, because the demons of the war returned in full force. Tom tried to stay busy, working, drinking and drugging, doing anything to avoid confronting his demons. He kept thumbing through soldiers of fortune fantasizing about enlisting as a mercenary in one of the many regional wars then raging in Africa. That spring, he took out his Harley and rode up to the Kangamas Highway in New Hampshire. 
The vibrations, speed and danger of that ride helped him pull himself back together to the point that he was able to leave his motel room and return to his family. The Reorganization of Perception Another study I concluded at the VA started out as a research about nightmares but ended up exploring how trauma changes people's perceptions and imagination. Bill, a former medic who had seen heavy action in Vietnam a decade earlier, was the first person enrolled in my seminary and had been assigned to his first parish in a congregational church in Boston suburb. He was doing fine until he and his wife had their first child. Soon after the baby's birth, his wife, a nurse, had gone back to work while he remained at home, working on his weekly sermon and other parish duties and taking care of his newborn. On the very first day, he was left alone with the baby. It began to cry and he found himself suddenly flooded with unbearable images of dying children in Vietnam. Bill had to call his wife to take over the childcare and came to VA in a panic. He described how he kept hearing sounds of babies crying and seeing images of burnt and bloody children's faces. My medical colleagues thought that he must surely be psychotic because the textbooks of the time said that the auditory and visual hallucinations were symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia. The same text that provided his diagnosis also supplied a cause. Bill's psychosis was probably triggered by his feeling displaced in his wife's affections by their new baby. As I arrived at the intake office that day, I saw Bill surrounded by worried doctors who were preparing to inject him with a powerful antipsychotic drug and ship him off to a locked ward. They described his symptoms and asked my opinion. Having worked in a previous job and a ward specializing in the treatment of schizophrenics, I was intrigued. Something about the diagnosis didn't sound right. I asked Bill if I could talk with him, and after hearing his story, I unwittingly paraphrased something Sigmund Freud had said about trauma in 1895. I think this man is suffering from memories. I told Bill that I would try to help him, and after offering him some medications to control his panic, asked if he would be willing to come back a few days later to participate in my nightmare study. He agreed. As part of my study, we gave our participants a Rorschach test. Unlike tests that require answers to straightforward questions, responses to the Rorschach are almost impossible to fake. Rorschach provides us with a unique way to observe how people construct a mental image from what is basically a meaningless stimulus, a blot of ink. Because humans are meaning-making creatures, we have a tendency to create some sort of image or story out of those ink blots, just as we do when we lie in a meadow on a beautiful summer day and see images in the clouds floating high above. What people make out of these blots can tell us a lot about how their minds work. On seeing the second card of the Rorschach test, Bill exclaimed in horror, This is that child that I saw being blown up in Vietnam. In the middle, you see the charred flesh, the wounds, and the blood is spurting out all over. Panting and with sweat beating on his forehead, he was in a panic similar to the one that had initially brought him to the VA clinic. Although I had heard veterans describing their flashbacks, this was the first time I actually witnessed one. In that very moment in my office, Bill was obviously seeing the same images, smelling the same smells, and feeling the same physical sensations he had felt during the original event. Ten years after helplessly holding a dying baby in his arms, Bill was reliving trauma in response to an ink blot. Experiencing Bill's flashback firsthand in my office helped me realize the agony that regularly visited the veterans I was trying to treat and helped me appreciate again how critical it was to find a solution. The traumatic event itself, however horrendous, had a beginning, a middle, and an end. But I now saw that the flashbacks could be even worse. You never know when you will be assaulted by them again, and you have no way of telling when they will stop. It took me years to learn how to effectively treat flashbacks, and in this process, Bill turned out to be one of my most important mentors. When we gave the Rorschach test to 21 additional veterans, the response was consistent. 16 of them, on seeing the second card, reacted as if they were experiencing a wartime trauma. The second Rorschach card is the first card that contains colors and often elicits so-called color shock in response. The veterans interpreted this card with descriptions like, These are the bowels of my friend Jim after a mortar shell ripped him open and this is the neck of my friend Danny after his head was blown off by a shell while we were eating lunch. None of them mentioned dancing monks, fluttering butterflies, men on motorcycles, or any of the other ordinary, sometimes whimsical images that most people see. 
While the majority of the veterans were greatly upset by what they saw, the reactions of the remaining five were even more alarming. They simply were blank. This is nothing, one observed. Just a bunch of ink. They were right, of course, but the normal human response to ambiguous stimuli is to use our imagination to read something into them. We learned from these Rorschach tests that traumatized people have a tendency to superimpose their trauma on everything around them and have trouble deciphering whatever is going on around them. There appeared to be a little in between. We also learned that trauma affects the imagination. The five men who saw nothing in the blots had lost the capacity to lead their minds play, but so too had the other 16 men, for in viewing scenes from the past in those blots, they were not displaying the mental flexibility that is the hallmark of imagination. They simply kept replaying an old reel. Imagination is absolutely critical to the quality of our lives. Our imagination enables us to live our routine everyday existence by fantasizing about travel, food, sex, falling in love or having the last word, all the things that make life interesting. Imagination gives us the opportunity to envision new possibilities. It is an essential launch pad for making our hopes come true. It fires our creativity, relieves our boredom, alleviates our pain, enhances our pleasure, and enriches our most intimate relationships. When people are compulsively and constantly pulled back into the past, to the last time they felt intense involvement and deep emotions, they suffer from a failure of imagination, a loss of the mental flexibility. Without imagination, there is no hope, no chance to envision a better future, no place to go, no goal to reach. The Rorschach tests also taught us that traumatized people look at the world in a fundamentally different way from other people. For most of us, a coming down the street is just someone taking a walk. A rape victim, however, may see a person who is about to molest her and go into a panic. A stern school teacher may be an intimidating presence to an average kid, but for a child whose stepfather beats him up, she may represent a torturer and precipitate a rage attack or a terrified cowering in the corner. Stock in trauma. Our clinic was inundated with veterans seeking psychiatric help. However, because of an acute shortage of qualified doctors, all we could do was put most of them on a waiting list, even as they continued brutalizing themselves and their families. We began seeing a sharp increase in arrests of veterans for violent offenses and drunken brawls, as well as an alarming number of suicides. I received permission to start a group for young Vietnam veterans to serve as a sort of holding tank until real undergoes therapy could start. At the opening session for a group of former Marines, the first man to speak flatly declared, I do not want to talk about the war. I replied that the members could discuss anything they wanted. After half an hour of excruciating silence, one veteran finally started to talk about his helicopter crash. To my amazement, the rest immediately came to life, speaking with great intensity about their traumatic experiences. All of them returned the following week and the week after. In the group, they found resonance and meaning in what had previously been only sensations of terror and emptiness. They felt a renewed sense of the comradeship that had been so vital to their war experience. They insisted that I had to be part of the newfound unit and gave me a marine captain's uniform for my birthday. In retrospect, that gesture revealed part of the problem. You were either in or out. You either belonged to the unit or you were nobody. After trauma, the world becomes sharply divided between those who know and those who don't. People who have not shared the traumatic experience cannot be trusted because they can't understand it. Sadly, this often includes spouses, children and co-workers. Later, I led another group, this time for veterans for Patton's army, men now well into their 70s, all old enough to be my father. We met on Monday mornings at 8 o'clock. In Boston winter, snowstorms occasionally paralyze the public transit system, but to my amazement, all of them showed up even during blizzards, some of them trudging several miles through the snow to reach the VA clinic. For Christmas, they gave me a 1940s GI issue wristwatch. As had been the case with my group of Marines, I could not be their doctor unless they made me one of them. Moving as these experiences were, the limits of group therapy became clear when I urged the men to talk about the issues they confronted in their daily lives, their relationship with their wives, children, girlfriends and family, dealing with their bosses and finding satisfaction in their work, their heavy use of alcohol, their typical response was to balk and resist and instead recount yet again how they had plunged a dagger through the heart of a German soldier in the Hoodgen forest or how their helicopter had been shot down in the jungles of Vietnam. 
whether the trauma had occurred 10 years in the past or more than 40 my patients could not bridge the gap between their wartime experiences and their current lives somehow the very event that caused them so much pain had also become their sole source of meaning they felt fully alive only when they were revisiting their traumatic past diagnosing, diagnosing post traumatic stress. stress in those early years at the va we leveled our veterans with all sorts of diagnoses alcoholism substance abuse depression mood disorder even schizophrenia and we tried every treatment in our textbooks but for all our efforts it became clear that we were actually accomplishing very little the powerful drugs we prescribed often left the men in such a fog that they could barely function when we encouraged them to talk about the precise details of a traumatic event we often inadvertently triggered a full blown flashback rather than helping them resolve the issue many of them dropped out of treatment because we were not only failing to help but also sometimes making things worse A turning point arrived in 1980 when a group of Vietnam veterans aided by a New York psychoanalyst, Shame Shaitan, and Robert J. Lifton successfully lobbied the American Psychiatric Association to create a new diagnosis, Post Traumatic Stress Disorder, PTSD, which described a cluster of symptoms that was common to a greater or lesser extent to all of our veterans. Systematically identifying the symptoms and grouping them together into a disorder finally gave a name to the suffering of people who were overwhelmed by horror and helplessness. With the conceptual framework of PTSD in place, the stage was set for a radical change in our understanding of our patients. This eventually led to an explosion of research and attempts at finding effective treatments. Inspired by the possibilities presented by this new diagnosis, I proposed a study on the biology of traumatic memories to the VA. Did the memories of those suffering from PTSD differ from those of others? For most people, the memory of an unpleasant event eventually fades or is transformed into something more benign. But most of our patients were unable to make their past into a story that happened long ago. The opening line of the grand rejection read, It has never been shown that PTSD is relevant to the mission of the Veterans Administration. Since then, of course, the mission of the VA has become organized around the diagnosis of PTSD. and brain injury and considerable resources are dedicated to applying evidence based treatments on the course to traumatized war veterans by the time things were different and unwilling to keep working in an organization whose view of reality was so at odds with my own i handed in my resignation in 1982 i took a position at the massachusetts mental health center the harvard teaching hospital where i had trained to become a psychiatrist my new responsibility was to teach a fledgling area of study psychopharmacology the administration of drugs to alleviate mental illness in my new job i was confronted on an almost daily basis with issues i thought i had left behind at the va my experience with combat veterans had so sensitized me to the impact of trauma that i now listened with a very different ear when depressed and anxious patients told me stories of molestation and family violence I was particularly struck by how many female patients spoke of being sexually abused as children. This was puzzling as the standard textbook of psychiatry at the time stated that incest was extremely rare in the United States, occurring about once in every million women. Given that there were then only about 100 million women living in the United States, I wonder how 47, almost half of them had found their way to my office in the basement of the hospital. Furthermore the textbook said there is little agreement about the role of father daughter incest as a source of serious subsequent psychopathology my patients with incest histories were hardly free of subsequent pathology on the course they were profoundly depressed confused and often engaged in bizarrely self harmful behaviors such as cutting themselves with razor blades the textbook went on to practically endorse incest explaining that such incestuous activity diminishes the subject's chance of psychosis and allows for a better adjustment to the external world in fact as it turned out incest had devastating effects on women's well-being in many ways these patients were not so different from the veterans i had just left behind at the va they also had nightmares and flashbacks they also alternated between occasional bouts of explosive rage and long periods of being emotionally shut down Most of them had great difficulty getting along with other people and had trouble maintaining meaningful relationships. As we now know, war is not the only calamity that leaves human lives in ruins. 
while about a quarter of the soldiers who serve in war zones are expected to develop serious post traumatic problems the majority of the americans experience a violent crime at some time during their lives and more accurate reporting has revealed that 12 million women in the united states have been victims of rape more than half of all rapes occur in girls below age 15 for many people the war begins at home Each year about 3 million children in the United States are reported as victims of child abuse and neglect. 1 million of these cases are serious and credible enough to force local child protective services or the courts to take action. In other words, for every soldier who serves in a war zone abroad, there are 10 children who are in danger in their own homes. This is particularly tragic since it is very difficult for growing children to recover when the source of terror and pain is not enemy combatants but their own caretakers. A new, a new understanding. understanding in the three decades since i met tom we have learned an enormous amount not only about the impact and manifestations of trauma but also about ways to help traumatized people find their way back since the early 1990s brain imaging tools have started to show us what actually happens inside the brains of traumatized people this has proven essential to understanding the damage inflicted by trauma and has guided us to formulate entirely new avenues of despair We have also begun to understand how overwhelming experiences affect our innermost sensations and our relationship to our physical reality, the core of who we are. We have learned that trauma is not just an event that took place sometime in the past, it is also the imprint left by that experience on mind, brain and body. This imprint has ongoing consequences for how the human organism manages to survive in the present. Trauma results in a fundamental reorganization of the way mind and brain manage perceptions. It changes not only how we think and what we think about but also our very capacity to think. We have discovered that helping victims of trauma find the words to describe what has happened to them is profoundly meaningful, but usually it is not enough. The act of telling the story doesn't necessarily alter the automatic physical and hormonal responses of bodies that remain hyper vigilant, prepared to be assaulted or violated at any time. For real change to take place, the body needs to learn that the danger has passed. and to live in the reality of the present our search to understand trauma has led us to think differently not only about the structure of the mind but also about the processes by which it heals, heals.